Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In his essay, The Present Age, Søren Kierkegaard is going to make a rather startling claim about what he's calling the present age, which could be our own. He says that it has nullified the principle of contradiction. And now if you've had some, you know, metaphysics or you've, you've worked through some logic, you might say, well, wait a second, I don't think that that's actually possible. The principle of contradiction, which is sometimes also called the law of non-contradiction, seems to be the sort of thing that you, you can't get away from. So what is the, the law of non-contradiction or the principle of contradiction? There's a, a number of ways of framing it. You can say that contradictory statements cannot both be true at the same time. Or if you have two contraries, one of them can be true. The other has to be you know, not true. Right? It could be that both are, are actually false. But if you've got one, you can't have the other. And so to nullify that would be to say, this could be a book and not a book, or I can be both living and dead at the same time. And there are ways around that. You can play with words that are ambiguous and say, well, you're dead in this sense and living in this sense. You're, you're dead to sin, but alive to you know, the possibilities of the world. Right? But now you're not using the terms in the same way. And so somebody who's, who's in favor of, of saying that the law of contradiction applies everywhere could say, we can qualify this and say that it's in the same sense. So this can't both be a book and not be a book at the same time in the same sense, right? Or pick whatever else you want. And so if you put it like that, then it sounds really strange to say that anything could, could nullify the principle of contradiction. It seems like once you open the door to that, well, anything goes. And Kierkegaard doesn't think that. So what's going on here? There's something else that he has in mind. And I think it can be very helpful if we think about the content of the law that he is talking about. He's not talking about pure theoretical philosophy. He's really talking about what we call the sphere of the practical, the sphere of action and commitment, choices. And it doesn't even have to be philosophy. It can be broader than that. So there's actions or choices, right? And we can also talk about certain types of comportment or other things that are, that are you know, contradictory or opposed to each other as being governed by this as well, and we'll look at that in a moment. But let's start with the thinking about it in terms of action and choice. So it's very helpful to go back to the earlier essay, because remember, the present age is, is part of a book review in which he talks about the present age, but he also talks about the age of revolution. So he tells us that the age of revolution is essentially passionate. Therefore, it has not nullified the principle of contradiction and can become either good or evil, whichever way is chosen. The impetus of passion is such that the trace of an action marking its progress or it's taking a wrong direction must be perceptible. So that, that's a way of saying in an age that actually has passion, people commit themselves for good or for bad, but they commit themselves in one way or the other. And notice that there is a principle of contradiction here. Choose the good 
If you choose the good, you don't choose the bad. Choose the bad, you don't get the good. And, and as a matter of fact, a lot of the <clears throat> ways in which people go wrong are by saying, I can have both the good and the bad at the same time, which is really to choose the bad, just to choose it under a different guise. We can also sometimes say, well, you have to choose between contradictory goods. You can't have all of them. And what decides it for the person is not simply taking an action. It's being motivated by passion. It's an expression of the passion that one has that makes one the person that one is, for better or for worse. So he talks a little bit later in that section about there being a crucial either or. And he says, the presence of the crucial either or depends on the individual's own impassioned desire directed towards acting decisively upon the individual's own intrinsic competence. And therefore a competent man covets an either or in every situation because he doesn't want anything more. And so people do existentially, at least <clears throat> many people, want to commit themselves and understand where they fit in, for better or for worse, who they are, for good or for evil. So <clears throat> this is an application of the principle of contradiction by a person. They choose one side or the other. In the present age, Kierkegaard says this has actually become nullified so that, as he says, a person worn out in reflection um, you know, is, is not going to actually have that. He says, as soon as the individual no longer has essential enthusiasm and his passion, but is spoiled by letting his understanding frustrating, frustrate him every time he's going, he's going to act, he never in his life discovers the disjunction. The disjunction is that dividing thing that says either this or this, not both. And, you know, if you think about our own contemporary culture, it's become sort of a truism. People will say, listen, you, you got to choose this or you got to choose this. And why, can't, why do I have to choose between those? Why can't I have both? Why does it have to be an either or, not a both and? and there's plenty of things where it could be a both and, you know? If you go to the buffet, you can have both salad and steak or soup or whatever you want, right? That's the nature of a buffet. But when it comes to certain things in life, you have to choose. Or at least so long as there's this principle of contradiction in play, you have to choose. Maybe you can, in fact, have it all. But Kierkegaard is saying you, you actually can't. So in the, the essay, The Present Age, when he's discussing this, um, he tells us that this becomes an age of uh, losing intensity and gaining extensity. This is something that has been discussed under the, the notion of like the mathematical, right? You put together so many people and you get an individual, which by itself sounds rather paradoxical, and the realm of publicity, the public. So he tells us the present age is essentially a sensible age devoid of passion. Because it's devoid of passion, it has nullified the principle of contradiction. And then he says, Generally speaking, compared to a passionate age, a reflective age gains in extensity what it loses in intensity, but this extensity may become the condition for a higher form. And then he goes on and he says, the, the existential expression of nullifying the princ principle of contradiction for a, a person is to be in contradiction to oneself. So contradiction doesn't completely go away it goes into one's own being, right? To be in contradiction to oneself. So he says, the creative omnipotence implicit in the passion of absolute disjunction that leads the individual resolutely to make up his mind. So this is what the previous age allowed or what could be possible for the single individual in the present age within the realm of what Kierkegaard calls the ethical, which he talks about in this, and within the realm of what he calls the religious by taking the leap, as he also talks about in this, 
that is the person who actually can, in fact, have this passion of absolute disjunction. I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I'm choosing this. I'm choosing against this. He says this is transformed by the extensity of prudence and reflection. What does that mean? Well, he tells us knowing and being everything possible to be in contradiction to oneself, that is to be nothing at all. And so he says, again, by contrast, the principle of contradiction strengthens the individual in faithfulness to himself so that they, they you know, uh, want to remain the same thing. He would rather be something small with faithful to himself than all sorts of things in contradiction to himself. But this becomes... You could say for the person who's caught up within the culture of the present age, who follows what he calls the principle of sociality, then this disjunction is lost. And something very important is lost in the process. And this is where we get to what he calls annulments of passionate disjunctions. Again, what are we talking about here? So a disjunction is something that goes along with the principle of contradiction. And an annulment is, you know, the abolition of it or the erasure of it, the breakdown of it. Now, interestingly enough, both sides do remain possibilities for the person, but they are not going to engage authentically, existentially in either side of the disjunction. And what we have here in chatter, formlessness, superficiality, philandering, being loquacious, is a kind of not quite middle point or mixture of what's on either side, but a sign of the breakdown of the disjunction. So he, he asks us, well, what is it to chatter? And he says, it is the annulment of the passionate disjunction between being silent and speaking. The person who chatters in a certain way does both and neither. Chattering is of less existential significance than speaking, committing oneself through words, or being silent. And in order to speak, you do need sort of a background of silence to speak against. And silence is broken by speaking. Chattering is really neither of these. He says, only the person who can remain essentially silent can speak essentially, can act essentially. Isn't that interesting? There's a connection between talking and silence and being able to act essentially. The chattering person is in some respect not only inauthentic in their discourse, but also in their action. It says chattering gets ahead of essential speaking and giving utterance to reflection has a weakening effect on action by getting ahead of it. Talkativeness gains in extensity. It talks about anything and everything and continues incessantly. So that's one important annulment. Uh, he talks about another one as being um, formlessness. And this is really interesting. He says, what is, the, what, is, what is formlessness? It is the annulled, passionate distinction between form and content. You might say, well, what, is that, what does that mean there, in form and content? He goes on and he says, in contrast to lunacy or being crazy and stupidity, it may contain truth, but the truth it contains can never be essentially true. So, you know, we have experiences of this all the time. There, there are things that are true, but they're not essentially true. They may be little bits of a narrative where those bits are actually true, but they construe a narrative that's actually in its core false. It's being used in, in deceptive ways or misleading ways or superficial ways, ways that just don't mean anything to us. The essentially true is only available because of this principle of contradiction. So he says that um, another key aspect of this, he says, the generality of formlessness in a reflective age devoid of passion expresses itself in the very opposite, a dominant propensity and inclination to act on principle 
right? And he says that the life of the person devoid of passion is not a self-manifesting and unfolding principle. On the contrary, his inner life is a hasty something, continually on the move, hunting for something to do on principle. So this is a very different sense of principle than what people had in previous ages. And, and I think you can recognize many people like this in our own time who are just looking for something that they can use to justify the stance that they're taking, oftentimes out of fear or a kind of desire or hunger. Superficiality. He brings that up as well. And he says that um, what is superficiality and its characteristic propensity, the exhibitionist tendency? Superficiality is the annulled passionate distinction between hiddenness and revelation. It is a revelation of emptiness, which by and large, nevertheless, does not have the deceptive advantage of jugglery over essential revelation, which has the uniform substance of depth. Whereas superficiality gives the appearance of being anything and everything. So there's no inner life, he says, to the person. There's no hiddenness. Superficiality is something that stands in the way both of authentic revelation, unfolding, showing oneself, and hiddenness or remaining within oneself. Philandering. This is a very interesting one that he, he brings up. What is philandering? Screwing around, right? We would say. It is the annulled passionate distinction between essentially loving and being essentially debauched. So, you know, here Kierkegaard is saying, listen, if you're going to like give yourself to hooking up, just like, you know, I mean, it's a bad thing, but just devote yourself to like immorality and, and you know, don't try to sanitize it. Don't try to make it nice and safe. Realize that, you know, you're, you're in between. Here's the two possibilities. Essentially loving, you know, and we could talk about it as, as what the uh, middle you know, medievals called conjugal love, where there's a self-giving to the other. There is a loving in return that takes place and a commitment or just like lose yourself in debauchery, one or the other. Don't have this, well, you know, we're, we're in an open marriage or, well, we all kind of cheat on each other. That's what he's caught to calling philandering here. And he says, neither the essential lover nor the essential debauchee is guilty of philandering. And here's a really interesting line, which dallies with possibility. Philandering is a form of indulgence that dares to touch evil and refrains from actualizing the good. And he says, by the way, there's a connection between that and the superficiality and, and formlessness that involves acting on principle, right? Because it, uh, he says acting on principle is also philandering. It vitiates moral action to the point of abstraction. And then he says, but in extensity, philandering has the advantage for you can philander with all sorts of things. But only one person can be loved essentially and in the proper understanding of erotic love. All adding is a subtracting. And the more one adds, the more one subtracts. Finally, he talks about being loquacious. This is going back to the chattering. He says, it is the annulled passionate distinction between subjectivity and objectivity. As abstract thought, loquacity is not sufficiently profound dialectically as conception and conviction. It lacks full-blooded individuality. But in extensity, in how it can be extended to things, loquacity has the apparent advantage. A thinker can comprehend his branch of knowledge. A person can have a concept of what's related to a particular subject. But the loquacious person chatters about anything and everything. So each of these is a way in which this principle of contradiction is nullified in a, a more specific mode. And these, Kierkegaard thinks, are characteristic not only of the culture of our time, but of many of the people of our time. And that means that they're missing out on what was on either side of the disjunction that they would have to decide passionately and through their action.